Hi everyone, welcome to the introduction to React.js workshop. This is a post recording of the front parts because I forgot to record the first few slides. So yep, before we start, uh, make sure you visit the bit.ly slash orbiter21-react. So that link will give you access to all the materials that we'll be using for this workshop, including the slides as well as all the code sandbox. So visit the link bit.ly slash orbiter21-react. So first, let me introduce myself. My name is Christopher Go, but you can just call me Chris. I'm a, currently a NUS Year 2 student going Year 3, uh, where I study Computer Science. I'm also an Orbiter Senior Advisor, where I take uh, 15 teams at the moment. So I'm also a core team member of NUS Hackers. So at NUS Hackers, we organize a lot of these type of workshops because uh, we want to help people, you know, uh, appreciate building products and show them how easy it is to build, like, start building like a fun app that they care about or anything that they care about just for fun or just because they're interested in it. So we had organized a lot of these type of workshops to equip people with the skills to um, do this type of like, to, to build stuff essentially. I'm currently an intern at Indeed and I've also used React as extensively during my time as an intern at Carousel and for CS3216, one of my mods in school where I did a lot of like web projects. So this workshop is actually a two-part workshop where for the first part today, we're going to go through like what is React, what is JSX, the key React concepts and like make a to-do list app together. And we're actually going to like uh, talk about deployment with Vercel as well. And for the part two, which is going to happen like one week later, we're going to talk about adding third-party libraries and using like common React UI frameworks and material UI to prettify the to-do list and integrating with like Firebase authentication and like Firebase Firestore. All right. So as you can see, just in part one itself, this is actually a lot to cover. So I'd like to set some expectations first. Firstly, we really only have two hours. So the aim of this workshop is really just to bootstrap you in the process of designing a web app. So it's not meant to be a super comprehensive like masterclass or anything. So we really just focus on the key concepts of React and the fun parts on how to like really get started with React and making a web app. Okay, and because we only have two hours, what you expect is we'll go very, very fast. And you might feel a bit lost. You might feel like you cannot really fully understand what I'm talking about and just relax because that's by design. And I'm also trying to experiment with a more interactive online workshop style. So there'll be exercises to try during this workshop. And of course, uh, some of them might be a bit difficult as well. So if you can't really like solve it within the time, and I expect you to not be able to solve it within that time, just try to read the code and try to understand the code and you should follow along fine. Okay. And of course, um, you will not become a React master by the end of these two hours. So this workshop is really just to get you started and there will be a lot of uh, other resources that I would really recommend that you read. So they're all uh, in the slides towards the end. Please try to self-study them. Okay. So how this workshop is going to work is that I will explain React concepts. Then I will live code using the aforementioned concepts. And then you'll be given some time to practice, read or understand the code. So after I show you some of the uh, concepts, uh, I'll give you all like three or four minutes to just try it out yourself to play around or just to read the code. Or some of you guys want to just take a quick toilet break or ask questions, that's fine as well. And then we'll just repeat that process. Okay, so because we really don't have a lot of time, today I'm actually not gonna use VS Code at all. So for those of you who actually went through the proper setting up steps for setting up VS Code, okay, your efforts are not wasted. You are gonna be using that for your own project, but today we are gonna use Code Sandbox, okay? All the Code Sandbox links are inside this link over here. So bit.ly slash orbiter21react. So make sure you visit it and keep it open. So what we are gonna make today, is we're gonna make this ugly to-do list, like I said at the start, okay? So I'm just gonna click on it and we can see how it works. So when you first open up the to-do list, what you see is that uh, you can set your name. So suppose your name isn't Chris, your name is like uh, Han Ming, okay? Then you, you say, welcome back Han Ming, okay? Then it will tell you like, um, just a random cat fact, okay? If I refresh the, the page, then it will say, it will show you another cat fact. And then you're able to add tasks. So suppose you're like, uh, go to sleep. Okay, then you add. 
then you can then you show up in the list and then you can mark it as complete or not complete. And even um, when you refresh the page, everything is still here. And when you mark everything as complete, you can see this number going down. You have one task that is not complete. You have zero tasks that are not complete, that type of thing. All right, so this is what we're gonna make today. How do I go back to my slides? Uh, okay, I guess I need to start the slide. All right, so back to the slides. Uh, what, what is React? So actually this workshop is packed at a level where you guys don't really know how to make web apps. I never really tried out using React. So I'm just gonna like introduce what React is. So React is an open source JavaScript library that's used for building front, front end web applications. It's created by some Facebook engineer and it's currently maintained by Facebook. Okay, and React is actually open source. If you go to like, github.com slash uh, facebook slash react you can actually see react source code and the thing you need to know about react is everything about react is written in javascript it just interacts with the web browser but it's just an abstraction for us to make it easy for us to build front-end web applications okay so react is used by like facebook instagram web uh, airbnb uber netflix uh, that type of thing it's used by a lot of people all around the world but uh, it's uh, more Nearer to us, what you'll be more familiar with is that NUS mods is um, built with React. And for those of you who took CS 101S, Source Academy is built with React. Even Straits Time is built with React. And uh, even though Straits Time is kind of a bad website, it's, like, it's very slow and everything, but it still uses, like they still use React as well. Lah. So it's used very widely all over the world. And um, I'm gonna just roughly run through how web apps work. So this is you over here. Usually what happens is that you will interact with your web browser. So suppose you use Firefox or Chrome and you click around on the website. So what it does is it actually makes a HTTP request to the front end. So the front end is the website that you see. So the website that you see and you interact with and people can use like React to build this. And then the front end will usually like re retrieve some data from the back end. So the back end is like this server somewhere that is like, uh, processing and keeping the data that you need. And then this back end could possibly be linked to a database as well, where it stores some data and all. And this back end will actually like interact with the front end. It will send like a response to the front end so that the front end actually sees the data that it needs to see. Okay. So um, today we're going to cover React for the front end, but of course, uh, you, you know, there are other alternatives that are very popular as well, such as Vue. Vue, is, Vue and React are, are probably the most popular web frameworks for front-end at the, at the moment. And yeah, and you have like alternative frameworks for like the back-end and for like your database as well. But uh, please don't get me wrong. Uh, this is not like what you guys have to make if you are making a web app. A lot of web apps actually don't require like a back-end or anything. They can just integrate with Firebase and all. So this is just like a typical model of what a web app might look like, okay? So of course today we're gonna dive deep into React on the front end, how to build a nice front end app with React. So how does React work? Okay, so um, from what we know about the web browser, right? Okay, basically the web browser just takes in HTML, takes in CSS and takes in JavaScript. So HTML defines the structure and the skeleton of a website. And then the CSS makes it look pretty, makes it look like the, the things are laid, laid out properly and everything. Um, and then JavaScript just makes it more interactive. So that's how a website works. And usually what happens is that there's something called a document object model. Okay. So on the left, you have, you see like a typical HTML website where you have like a body and you have a heading and you have a paragraph, but Usually where this type of like a markup, HTML markup will be converted by the web browser to, to like a, this type of tree structure, okay? This type of like a tree structure where we, where inside this HTML element, you have like a head. Then this HTML element also has like a body. Then the body sort of just defines how your website looks like. The structure and everything that's displayed on it, that's how it, it, will, de be de it will define how it looks like. 
Okay, so that's the document object model. And this document object model, this DOM tree structure will then be converted to what you actually see on the web browser. So in the past, when you try to click on a link on a website, the website actually is reloaded and the server will send back a new HTML file for each request, even if uh, some parts of the website looks the same. Okay, so for example, if you were browsing Wikipedia, you see that Wikipedia has like a header bar, it has like a sidebar that looks the same all the time. But even though you click from page to page, um, only the article content is changing, but it still redownloads and refetches the header as well as the sidebar and everything. Okay, so that's what people would usually do in the past. But with React, we have this concept called a single page application. That means when you visit a website, the website is really just one single page. And instead of reloading the entire page, the DOM, the, the browser DOM, document object model, is mutated using JavaScript. So only the elements that require changes are changed. Okay, so how does React know what needs to be changed? It uses a diffing algorithm. And a diffing algorithm is just an algorithm to compare like the states of two things and to see what's different between them. And an example of like what uses a different algorithm is like Git, okay? It uses a different algorithm to identify changes to your files, that type of thing. So what React essentially does is it's an abstraction over the browser DOM. And it provides a virtual DOM. It maintains a separate DOM is on its own. That's called a virtual DOM. And this virtual DOM is completely created in JavaScript, okay? So these changes are received by the virtual DOM in the React application, and then these changes are then propagated to the browser DOM. Okay, it sounds very abstract. There are a few diagrams in the next slide. So what happens is that, suppose you are using a web app and you want to interact with it and you call some state change. So what happens is that React will, com will compute the difference and see what actually needs to be re-rendered. So over here, suppose it is like your header, your sidebar, uh, you will see that, okay, the, the sidebar, that, there's no change. It won't re-render it. You will, will compute and see that the difference is only in like the, the page content. Then it will just trigger a re-render here. And then you commit the changes to the web browser's DOM where you will do the actual change. That's when the user actually sees the change in the DOM. Okay, so we are kind of finishing with the more abstract parts of React. We are finally going to start with the coding soon, but of course, I want to share why people use React. People use React because React is fast. Like I said, uh, it only changes the elements that need to be changed. So when you use like a React web app, you feel like you're using like a native app because uh, there's no like hard refresh. You don't see like a white screen before you see new content and uh, it only changes the content that needs to be changed and the different algorithm is fast. And React is a very intuitive to code in. So back then in the past, uh, people would code in like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript separately. But right now with React, we can actually write um, HTML in the JavaScript itself. So over here, you, you see plain, plain JavaScript. You, to create like a new div, you will need to like document.create element, the type of thing. But in JSX, JSX, JavaScript, XML, you can just like directly inside your JavaScript itself, define a HTML element. Okay, so React is also very widely used. Uh, if for those of you who are, who are making web apps, I think you'll be glad to find that, you know, when you are lost, when you Google for a question, you will see that there's a lot of help out there on the internet. Okay, there's also a lot of third party packages to make it very easy for you to just um, add new features. Like, so suppose you want to add like a drag and drop feature, you can just install a third party library to do that. Okay, and React is also very quite well documented. Even if you go to the ReactJS store, you see that you know the documentation there is quite high quality. You can just read it and you kind of get what's going on with React. So there are two main ways, two main ways of writing React code. Uh, the first one that is covered by the ReactJS tutorial is called the class components. So React actually first started with class components. It's called class components because uh, everything is written in like JavaScript classes. But we are not going to cover this today. But I, I think that you guys should still cover it in your own time. Just visit this thing over here. You can just read the documentation and you'll learn how to use it. But this is what most people are using today. What most people are using to write 
uh, React code. And this is functional hooks components. Okay, because it's a lot simpler, it's a lot more declarative. When you were writing class components, you still need to define like a render method over here. Okay, but for functional hooks components, essentially you are just writing a function and then you are just returning HTML over here. Okay, uh, again, you are just writing a function and this function just acts as a React component already and you will just return the HTML to that directly shows you what needs to be displayed on the web browser itself. Okay, so finally, let's start making our to-do list. So, okay, I just want to go dive deeper into what JSX is. So again, JSX allows HTML in JavaScript. So over here, I have a hello world component. Okay, hello world component. Over here, what you see, this is a, this is a, a function. This is a, a, like an anonymous function or lambda, whatever you call it, that returns just this uh, hello world div, right? But this can also be rewritten as a function that's hello world, and then it just returns the div, the, the, the div, the div, okay? That I'm just making sure I, I make a dis the distinction between div and div, so the div of hello world, okay? And the nice thing about JSX is that you can compose components together. So suppose you have a big component, Okay, I can reference this hello world component on top by just like writing the name of the component here, hello world. And what happens is that React will just interpret it as like it will just like like expand it, and then this div hello world will just be replaced with this div hello world div. Okay, so you can nest components around, and that's how we can use JSX. Okay, so next. We are going to cover some JSX rules. So any JavaScript in JSX must be enclosed within curly brackets. So over here, I'm running this JavaScript function math.seal of 3.6. And for me to use it inside this JSX, I need to enclose it in curly brackets. Okay, so when we use JSX, JSX is not exactly HTML. It's not exactly HTML, it's just an abstraction over like to make it feel like you're writing HTML. So your HTML and CSS attributes should be in camel case, and you cannot use certain like HTML attributes like class, right? Because a uh, class is a reserved keyword in JavaScript. So when you want to actually refer to classes in uh, React in JSX, you have to use class name instead. Okay, so that there's no confusion between the JavaScript class keyword and like the class name, the CSS class name that you're referring to. So um, before I move on, I'm going to talk about some terminology first that is not super important for you to understand, but it's good so that you don't get lost. So uh, when, you, when you talk about web apps, there's something called Node.js. So Node.js is a runtime for you to run JavaScript outside a browser. And React is also a package in Node.js. And um, I introduced you, I introduced you guys to Yarn, but we're not going to use it today, but essentially Yarn is like a package manager for Node.js. So it helps you to manage your, like your third party libraries, third party dependencies for Node.js project. Okay. Why use Yarn over the default NPM? Um, I would say that's a good question. Uh, I can't give you a very good answer right now. The facilitators can help come out with a reply for that. Sometimes, a lot of the time, it's like really up to your preference. Both kind of work, but for me, I'm more used to using Yarn, so I just kind of use it. Um, yeah, so um, over next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you guys to open up this code sandbox here. But inside this code sandbox, you will be seeing like a few files that might be quite confusing to you guys. And I'm going to run through what each of them do. Okay, so at first there's package.json. Package.json will tell you what are the dependencies, the libraries that are used inside your Node.js application. So when, suppose you add like a drag and drop library, you will end up over here as well, inside the dependencies. Okay, then there are Node modules. Node modules are essentially like uh, what, well, like when you actually add third party libraries, right? what NPM or YAN does, it, it will install it to node modules, it will download them and save them to node modules, 
And this usually is a very large directory with a lot of files. So if you use things like git, don't commit this node modules directory. Do not commit them. Just like git ignore them and don't commit it. Okay. And there's also these two files that's called like package log JSON or yan.log. Okay. We call this a log file. So it stores the exact version and the commit hash of like your dependencies. So that uh, suppose your code works on like your machine, right? And somebody else, suppose your teammate downloads your code and tries to install the same dependencies, they will still get the exact same version and your code will still run consistently. Okay. Then there will be this folder. Uh, yes, package.json is like a requirements.txt or in like your Python projects. Okay. So in the public public directory, it contains files that the users can access as, as okay, not really as URL, but it, it just contains files that the users can access. And usually what happens is that the first file you see is the index.html. And usually we write all our source files inside the JavaScript, like our JavaScript source files inside the source folder, SRC. Okay. So, um, I'm gonna open up this first code sandbox right now, and you guys should as well. Okay, just go to this bit.ly of beta than one react and just click on this, uh, click on the sandbox zero. Okay, so I'm just gonna briefly familiarize everyone with what this is. So when you open up this app, right? Okay, you can really just start typing on it. You won't edit my copy, you will just end up creating a copy of this sandbox and you guys will just edit your own copy of it. So feel free to just play around with it. Okay, for me, I'm gonna fork one version manually. Okay, so what you see here is you see this like IDE, everything you need to write React code is inside here already. You have your source files over here, like app.js, index.js, and make sure you click on this browser button. Okay, over here, there's a browser button, click on it, and then you will see that the pre preview of like your web app. Okay, so there is, is side by side, left and right, your code on the left, the preview on the right. And there's even a URL that you can access. This, the, the URL that you see will be different from mine. So this URL, you can even copy it, go to like a new tab, paste it in. And what you see is that you see like your actual app, standalone app on its own itself. Okay, and what I'm gonna show you here is, Right now I'm in app.js. So like I said, everything here is a function. Okay, what you see on the right, everything here is from this function called app. And everything inside here just looks like plain HTML. So if you guys are already kind of familiar with HTML, you can just play out round with it and edit it. Okay, so, so suppose I add like a hello orbiter. Okay, what you see here is the moment I type it in, right, your preview will just update immediately, okay? And if I kind of mess up the order of my HTML, okay, suppose my HTML be ends up being super ugly right now, okay, and I press Command S or Control S, Code Sandbox will just automatically format it for you. You will just run this two called Prettier and you will format your code for you. So don't worry about, you know, whether you do your indentation correctly or anything, do you need to GG equals G, you don't need to do that. Just save your file, everything will format for you. Okay, so right now, the first task over here is, I want you guys to open up Sandbox Zero and we're gonna turn this uh, very bare bones skeleton over here, okay? It just has like some words on top, this top left box, top right box, okay? We're gonna recap on our HTML. And what we're gonna do is, we're gonna try to turn this, into something on, that looks like it on the right. You don't have to follow my version exactly. You can like customize it to your own liking, have your own title for your to-do list because I wasn't too creative. So I come up with a very lame title for the to-do list. But you guys can just like, you know, write, use write, write HTML and just like, just put your name here or anything. It, okay. The purpose of this exercise is to just make sure the skeleton of things is out. It, it doesn't have to like work yet. Your numbers don't have to update dynamically as long as it looks somewhat like that, okay, it's fine. And it's also a good time for you to like be familiarized with the whole environment. So like I said, uh, there's this package.json which specifies what dependencies we are using. So the third party libraries we are using today is React. 
and like a few other stuff that's created by this thing called Create React App. Okay, so what you need to know about React is that React is really just a JavaScript library. So at the core of it, it's still a HTML file. It's still a HTML file where we sort of just, uh, where we sort of just uh, uh, inject the React um, framework into it. And the starting point of the React app is really just this index.js. So this index.js, it, it tells the React to render itself into the root element. Okay, the root element is just the root element here. And the, what we are gonna work on today is entirely within the app component today. So the app component is just within this app.js. Okay, so right now I'm gonna give everyone four minutes to just try out this simple exercise. You don't have to fully complete it. I'll go through how the right answer. So four minutes, familiarize yourself with the environment and we'll try to like play around with it and come up with something like that. All right. And the four minutes will start now. Okay, I will spend this time answering questions as well. So Jia Lun asked, why can we run the front end library outside of a browser in Node? I thought it's supposed to interface the browser renderer. So um, I'm not 100% sure about this, but what I think is happening is um, basically when we write code in Node.js uh, with like React, what's happening is that um, it's kind of like a development version of like our code, but when we actually like, uh, so like it comes with a lot of like convenient scripts. So it, it actually runs on Node.js completely when we develop it. So like suppose you want to like start like a own local server and everything. So that's completely within Node.js itself. And then uh, it, it kind of offers like all the React stuff along with it. But when we actually export the website, as like plain HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, that's when it interacts with the browser itself. Okay, which is why uh, at the start, we, we first start off with like a Node.js application. That's when we do development. Then only when we build it and export it, then it's plain HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Okay, we'll have about three minutes left to familiarize and just play around with the HTML.
another 30 seconds to go. All right, okay, we'll just continue now. Okay, sure. So, yeah, so I'll just briefly run through like how to get to that part. So over here, we have a top left box and a top right box, and we actually wanted a title at the top, right? So again, even though we're writing a React app, it's really just the same as writing a typical HTML app. So of course, if you want a, a title, you can have like your, your very nice heading one. Then you can have like, have like my title. Okay. Then it will just appear at the top. Then at the top left box, we wanted like a nice uh, overview and at the top, top right box. And then we, we wanted like a, what do we want? We want a cat fact box, right? So over here, um, like, like I said, mentionally, it is really just like writing typical HTML. So uh, some cat fact. Then over here, you have an overview. So you can have like a, a welcome back. Okay, welcome back, Chris. Okay, then uh, because we wanted our name to be bold, so we just add like a strong element to it. Welcome back, Chris. Then we wanted like how many tasks are, are not done yet, right? So you have, uh, you have five tasks that are not done. Five tasks that are not done. Okay, then because right now this is like our title, right? So we can actually assign it to like a heading two or a heading three up to you. So heading two and we have like, Heading two and heading two. Okay, so try your best as much as possible to make use of this like semantic HTML elements that try to that tells the people and the web browser, you know, what's the rough structure of the content on your web page. Okay, this is for like accessibility accessibility purposes, which I will cover more about later as well. So, yeah, this is like briefly what we wanted to do. And we also wanted like a few more entries of like this table over here. So over here, we have a table body. Inside this table body, we have a table row. So it, since we want more rows, we can just copy paste this. Okay, and then you just change your number two and like uh, teach workshop. Then your number three, you can have like, um, uh, watch Netflix, that type of thing. Okay, so how how do you change whether these checkboxes are checked or not? So you can just, instead of true, this is false, and then you'll be unchecked. Okay, so you, what you need to recognize over here is that because this, this false over here is inside the curly brackets, this false is actually running as like JavaScript. Okay, then we will remove this as well then you end up looking around the same as what we had just now. Uh, what's the difference between the B tag and strong? That's a HTML question, which I think the facilitators will help me to answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, if I'm not wrong, B is like a very legacy tag and strong is kind of like better. Okay, so next up, we kind of like come up with the structure of it already. We're gonna actually start making it more interactive. All right. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna understand React states. So like I said, everything in React is a component. So state is basically like data that is stored in a component that you want it to be able to change. Okay, like when you during the when your web app is running and people interact with it, you want you want to change some like state while it's running. So when you want to use state, you will, will in, you would have to use this function that's called use state. 
So you need to remember to import it from the React library. And then you actually need to like call it in such a way. Okay, so you need to call this use state function. And then you need to pass in the default value over here. Okay, so you can think about it as like creating like a variable. So this, in a sense, is like creating a variable in React. Okay, so this use state, what it does is it will create this variable, this state with like this default value and it will return an array of like the actual value itself as well as a setter of the value itself. Okay, so this syntax might be a bit confusing for you guys, but basically this is called array destructuring. Okay, essentially this function returns an array and you just want to take out the parts of the array, the, the zeroth element, the first element, and then give it some name. Okay, so whenever like this state changes, right, the component will be rendered. Okay, so I'm gonna just show you the first exercise, it'll be a guided exercise. I'm gonna try to make this John Doe name that changeable. Okay, and we'll start from sandbox one. Sandbox one is the same as what I just did earlier. So I'm just gonna continue with, uh, hang on. I'm gonna continue with this. Okay, so we're gonna make it such that we can tap on this name and we can change the name. And what's gonna happen is, so right now we only have one file. So over here, I will define this new state that's called a name. So I'll first need to have a variable for the name and a setter for the name. Okay, and we, we give it a use state and we want to set a default value for it. So a default value, we can say like John Doe. Okay, and because this is red squiggly, squiggly line here because we did import it. So import use state from React. Okay. So over here we, okay. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with this syntax, we basically we are trying to say we want this specific import, the, so this specific export from the React, from the React library. And this, we just want this function called use state. Okay, then what's gonna happen is, I'm just gonna, instead of displaying my, like hard coding the crease over here, right? Uh, we can just change this to JavaScript. So first we change the JavaScript by adding the curly brackets and we're gonna change this to name. And then what you will see over here is, it will just end up with John Doe at the moment. Okay, but what's gonna happen is I'm gonna try to make it slightly more interactive. Um, yeah, so right now there's a name over here. I'm gonna make it such that I can click on it to change it. So I'm just gonna add an event handler that's called on click. Okay, on click. Then again, inside I need to put in a JavaScript function. So what's gonna happen when I click on this, um, name over here is I'm gonna do something that's uh, called prom. Okay, there's this JavaScript function called prom. It comes out of a box and you will like ask you for like something. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask what is your name? And what's the, the default value we're gonna put over here is the name itself. Okay, and the user's response will be the return value of this function. So I'm gonna assign it to this constant over here. This is our new name. And then I'm gonna set my new name. Set name, and then I'm gonna set it to new name. New name. Okay, so, okay, so like I said, the code just now was ugly and unreadable. I just save it once. Uh, Prettier will format the entire code block for me. So what's, I'm gonna just try it out now. I'm gonna click on it, and then it's ask, what is your name? So over here, because I specified name as at the default value, that's why I see it over here. So I can change my name to Chris. Then I click on OK. Then it will just set the name to Chris. It will just set the name to Chris. And then it will just update what is displayed over here. Okay. So the first question that you guys might ask is, why do you use like this lambda over here? Why do you use this um, arrow function over here? Okay, so the you you see a lot of like a UI interaction in like React and like JavaScript that requires a lot of arrow function, and the reasoning is quite simple. We just 
are trying to delay the evaluation of this code block, right? So for those of you who, especially those of you who took CS 2030, you'll be very familiar with like trying to delay evaluation by stuffing things inside a Lambda. So this is the, the same concept. We don't actually want to run this function yet. We only want to run it when people actually click on it. So this is why this has to be inside an arrow function. So this might find, you might find it a bit unreadable for you guys. You can actually like refactor it into like a uh, handle name click. Okay. And then I'll just define this Lambda inside here. Handle name click. And it will still work. Okay. So same thing. You just define your Lambda function here. You can give it a name. You can just pass it in like that. So everything inside the curly bracket is JavaScript. Okay, so right now I am gonna just, okay, I'm gonna show you guys a bug over here. If I click on this and I delete it, so I don't set anything over here and I click on okay. Suddenly I am not able to reset my name again because right now my name is an empty string. Right now it's an empty string and there's nothing for me to click on. Okay, there's nothing for me to click on, which is why I cannot like click on it again. So what we can do over here is we can do something called conditional rendering. So uh, I want to bring your attention to this thing over here called name, right? So this name over here is uh, what we are actually using to display. It. What we can actually do is we can use a uh, all over here. So name or set a name. Okay, how do you read this? What this says is that, okay, I want to display a name, but if my name is an empty string, in JavaScript, an uh, uh, empty string is a falsy value. Falsy value meaning that you, if, you, if, you, if you try to interpret it as a Boolean, it'll be false. Then you end up showing the right-hand side instead. So this is how you kind of set like default values. Then right now I'm actually able to click on it and actually like fix the problem. Okay, there's also something else I want to cover. So over here, this is actually not like a, like we can actually click on it and like type it and like interact with it, right? So in a sense, this is actually a UI element that you can interact with. But right now in our HTML, it doesn't really tell people that you can interact with it. So you can actually add like this row tag. And then you can say that this row is a button so that people actually know that they can interact with it. Okay, this is not a proper way to create a button. There's actually like, if you went for the HTML, uh, CSS thing just earlier, you can you actually know that there's a button thingy that you can actually use that actually creates a real button. But in the situations where we have to use something else as a button, it's very good for us to specify the role of stuff, okay? Why is it good for us to specify the role of stuff is for accessibility purposes, because um, you need to know that sometimes even people who like are visually impaired, okay, they also use the internet. People who are blind, they are visually impaired, they also use the internet and they use things like screen readers. So we want to create web apps that are also nice for them to use. So it would be great if we could, you know, uh, indicate what's the purpose of certain things on the websites for them. So this kind of this kind of role equals to button thing it, it, it adds on to the accessibility it's kind of a hacky way but it still adds on to the accessibility all right so i'm gonna give you guys like three more minutes for you to just read the code okay the the to just try it out yourself and read the code and the, your time will start now And if you guys are slightly lost on what to do, I'm just gonna show the code here.
Okay, 30 seconds left. All right, I'm going to continue. So just now, uh, Meng Zhe asked a very interesting question, which I'm going to share with everyone. So he asked, what is, the, what is this uh, bracket space bracket inside over here? So the thing is, right, uh, like I said, this is HTML. But the thing is, we can't actually like, we can't actually type a space over here. Okay, because when we type a space over here, um, because it's a JavaScript file, a space just means nothing. It will just not be interpreted. But when we actually want a space, okay? So right now there's no space over here. Uh, that's, that's why it looks kind of ugly now because there's no space between here and here. When we actually want a space, we need to like add a space over here using JavaScript. And that's why we, that's how we actually create a space inside JSX. So most of the time you don't actually have to do it yourself. Uh, Prettier will do it for you. So. Yeah, don't be surprised when you see this, okay? So next up, uh, I hope that some of you were able to like try to accomplish this and or just read the code to try to understand the, the purpose of like having use state. Okay, so next we're going to talk about how to refactor the long code into smaller components, all right? Because uh, right now, if you look at our app, Okay, everything is inside app.js. The file is super long and it's not very readable. Okay, we are going to just refactor it into like smaller um, components so that our app is actually much more readable and maintainable. So what I'm going to do here, uh, you guys don't have to do this, just follow along. Okay, so right now I have a header over here. I can just uh, put this header into another file. Okay, I, mean, I just cut out the, out the whole code. Now I'm just going to create a new folder. Okay, usually we create a new folder called components just for components. It's up to you how you want to name your folder, how you want to structure it. Then inside here, we just create a new file. We call it header.js. Okay, so over here, we just have a function called our header. And same as before, we just return everything that we copied so far. Okay, this is just plain JavaScript, plain JSX. We are just making it into smaller files, header, header. Then of course, the refactoring is not done yet because it's missing handle name, it's missing the name. So of course we need to shift it over as well. Okay, so read squiggly line because we didn't import use state. Okay, it's done, but I can tell that the app still doesn't work because I haven't included, you see the header is gone. So I, I affected it into another file, this uh, component called header, but I didn't add it to this file over here. So what you need to do is you need to import header from and then you need to specify the path to it. So the path to it is the current folder components header. And this will fail. And you will see why. Interesting. It's not failing yet, but we'll make it fail very soon. Um, over here, I'm going to add like, yeah. So we will just reference that component we used earlier. Okay. So this component we named, sorry, this component we name it header. So for us, since we imported it as header, right, we can just header slash. Okay, so right now the bug happens because they say the element type is invalid. Okay, so it expected a string, but it got like an object. So what's so basically they give you a very useful error message. You likely forgot to export your component from the file. So when you write this type of like components, 
you need to remember to export it. So just export default header. Okay, now your app works. Okay, so what's happening is that we were trying to ask for the default export from this file, but because we didn't export it earlier, then we couldn't like just use it. All right, so the thing is, um, yeah, when you actually import like this style of, even though it's named header over here, I can name it like to do list header, to do header, okay? And it will still work. Okay, we are, uh, JavaScript is not that strict on the naming. So even though you export it as a header here, you can just rename it over here as well. Okay, if I wanted to use use state as like something else, use use state as use crease state, for example, I could even, why, yeah. So I could even do this, then I could, oh wait, oh yeah, it's not being used here. Yeah, but suppose I wanted, if I really wanted to, I don't see why you would do this. You could import use state as use crease state. Then I could even use crease state. And it will still work. Okay, but please don't do this. Just use the standard naming convention for use state. Okay, so that's how we make this into like a header component. Then of course, right now we have a to-do header and we want to like continue abstracting the rest of the stuff. Okay, so what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna abstract it into uh, everything inside main here. I'm gonna abstract it into my task stuff. Okay, from here to here. Okay, I'll, everything inside of main, I'm gonna abstract it into all my task related stuff. So I'm gonna just change this to, sorry, new file, taskmanager.js. Function task manager, then return. Okay, I'm, so I'll return this whole thing. Lots of squiggly lines is expected when you refactor stuff. So over here, I refactor it into this component and then, and then I'm gonna export default task manager, okay? So the thing is, we did the exact same thing as we did just now, but somehow there's a lot of great squiggly lines. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that React components typically expect you to return just one node, okay? But this thing that we're returning here, it has one items, it has two items, okay? So how you would solve this, how you could solve this is you can wrap it in a div. Okay, you could wrap it in a div, then you could wrap it in another div. Uh, wait, I deleted stuff, div. Okay, and this will solve the problem. All the red squiggly, squiggly lines are gone, but it's very weird for you to just add a separate div so that you can just return one item. So what we usually do here is we just return something called a fragment. A fragment means just this opening tag and this closing tag and this will still work okay so that's how we write a function component that has multiple items so we only want to return it as one item we return it as a fragment so of course for right now we don't see my task because over here i need to task manager and then because code sandbox is smart you will just click on it it will auto import Okay, then the next thing I'm gonna show you is inside this header.js itself, you can actually refactor like uh, it into even smaller components. So over here, you have these two boxes here. You have this overview box, this cat fat box. So what I'm gonna do is I'm inside this source source itself, I'm gonna refactor it into overview box. Okay, so right now I want to refactor into overview box. I just need to inside the same file function overview box, okay? And then I just return this. And because this overview box uses the name stuff, I just need to shift the name stuff inside here. 
Okay, I'm going to do another refactoring here. This is the cat fact box. So, cat fact box. And function cat fact box. Okay, so what I'm trying to show you here is within the same source, source file it, itself, you can also have multiple components. Okay, it's, it's, just, it's just up to you to help you organize your code such that it, it makes sense in a logical way and it makes it easy for you to maintain. So even though this header contains quite a few things, I can abstract it into smaller components itself. Okay, so suppose even if I wanted to use, okay, inside my task list, suppose my task list, I also wanted a cat fat box. Okay, I could just add it here too. But right now this doesn't work because I actually need to export this function. I need to export this component so that other, other React components can see this cat fat box. Then over here, I can just, okay, maybe not. Yeah, I can just uh, import the cat fat box. Okay, so right now I exported this cat fat box and then inside another React component, I can, inform, I can import this component as well and then I can use it here. Okay, so yeah, why do some imports have these curly brackets and why do some not have curly brackets? Okay, so the difference is these imports that don't have curly brackets, these are your default exports. Okay, so inside my task manager, I have a default export over here. Export default. But over here, my this export is not the default export. It's called a named export. So for me to use named as exports, I need to add a curly bracket to specify exactly which exports I want. Okay. But we don't actually need cafe box to be, to be used by other stuff. So I'm just going to take that away. Okay, so right now I've actually abstracted it into like a, a lot of smaller components over here. We, we actually did cover quite a lot in the past few minutes. So I'm, I'm just going to give you like another three minutes to just look at the completed product. Okay, just look at the completed product, see how the code is organized. And yeah, three minutes will start now. You don't have to pressure yourself to code, just read the code, try to digest what's going on.
All right, we are going to continue. I hope that you guys uh, took some time to really digest what we just did to like, you know, refactor our code into smaller components. Uh, in fact, we could even go even deeper and make our to-do list even like more minute components. So right now, the structure really just looks like this. There's an app. And we, inside the app, you have a header, you have a task manager. And inside this header itself, you have an overview box, you have a cat fact box. Okay, so really, um, the components are really very composable. So up to you guys to see how you want to go crazy with your own projects and all just uh, make it into small maintainable components so that it's very, your code base will be nice to read and nice to write as well. All right. So next, we are finally going to start implementing the to-do list functionality. And I can tell you that this to-do list functionality is going to take up a huge bulk of the time. It's going to be very complex. So just try to follow along. Okay, we're going to first try to make this add task box work. Okay, so I'm just going to guide you through how this will be done. Okay, so right now our add task box is really just a dumb box. Like you, it doesn't like, you can't even type into it. You can't, when you click on it, nothing happens. In fact, the page even refreshes that type of thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to make it work. Okay, so first we need to go to this component where it is located at. So add task. Okay, in this add task box, of course, because we want to save a list of tasks, we actually need a state variable for it. So we're gonna just gonna come up with a task and set task. Okay, by the way, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but usually when we write use state, right, we just write it like that, like the name of the variable and then set the name of the variable because uh, that's like the convention people use and we should just follow it. Okay, then use state. So we need to think about our task. How, what type of data type should we store it in? So of course, the most simple, simple one is an array. It's an array of tasks. So we just put in an empty array. All right. So squiggly lines again, because of, of course we didn't import use state. All right. So we have a state variable for task now. What we're going to do is we're going to make it such that we can type things into the box, type things in the box, and we can like save it into this task variable. So again, we need another state variable, but right now this state variable will actually save what we are typing in the box. So new task description, okay? And then we have a set new task description. Okay, so for our task description, what should be inside this box, uh, the default value should just be an empty string. So we just set it as, as an empty string. Okay, then right now we actually want to link up these variables. So over here we have this um, add task box, right? So this add task box right now is just displaying a value of an empty string. What we actually want to display is we want to display the new task description. Okay. So suppose if, if like my default value I set to high, then what's inside the box will be high. But you realize right now I can't edit it. I can't edit it because I don't have a on change. I don't have an on change event handler. So I need code to help me handle, handle what happens when I change the text over here. Okay. So so when whenever this box is changed, I need to set my new task description to event.target.text. Okay, so let's just try to see how it works now. I'm gonna like, okay, so right now I can edit it. And in fact, I'm just gonna do something here. Uh, something I didn't mention just now is a, a very useful tool that a lot of us unnecessarily spam is console.log. So you can just use it as, as like a print statement. So console.log uh, event.target.value. Okay, why is it? Sorry, event dot is it event.target.value or event.target.text? Event.target. I think it's event.target.value. Yep. Okay. So over here, right? Uh what's gonna happen is whenever I type something, whenever there's a change. You see the console, the console is at the bottom. It's printing 
my new stuff over here. So this is what happens when we have an on-chain handler. And why is it, how do you know that it's event.target.value? You just need to know that it is like that because uh, um, that you, you need a way to like, so when the on-chain event is fired, basically it's called an event. So we need to know what has changed in the event. So based on like the JavaScript and the browser specifications, the change is actually stored in event.target.value. So that's, you need to go to the MDN. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody has, like you guys should know about this. This MDN is like the most useful resource for like web developers. Then uh, in fact, you go to the React forms, okay? And you read like React code samples, you see that um, like, uh, Yeah, event.target.value in the handle.change. So that's how you know that you need to use something like that. You really need to go and read code samples, read documentation, and you will know that it's event.target.value. Okay, um, just for more information, a lot of these links over here, right? Uh, they're actually added as comments in like all my other sandboxes. So for example, inside, uh, inside this sandbox number four, I actually added like what I just said, as like a comment over here. So yeah, so so the 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 code sandboxes in like the other links that are better documented. So if you are a bit lost, just click on the ones that are more uh, current and you can just read up on them, okay? Yeah, so right now we can get the current task description in new task description already. So, Actually, before I move on, I just want to show you something. So over here, I set the new task description to event.target.value, and then I print event.target.value. What if I try to print out new task description? Okay. You realize that this kind of works, but it doesn't work correctly. Okay. Over here, I have one, two, three, four, five A's, but the last one that's printed is only four A's. So you need to realize that when you call functions like set new, like, like the setters in the set in, in new state, right? They're actually asynchronous and it's not, your, the change might not be directly reflected yet. So, which is why over here, when I printed the new stuff out, I printed it with event.target.value, okay? So the setters of new state, they are asynchronous. So now that we can actually like edit this text view over here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, make it such that this add button works, okay? So what's, what's gonna happen is, uh, right now, we, to, to make this add button work, I need to add uh, on submit handler to the form, okay? So what's gonna happen on submit is, we need another arrow function that specifies what happened when we submit the form. Uh, in fact, we're gonna pass it in into a actual function, handle add task, okay? So inside handle at task, what we're gonna take in is, we're gonna take in an event, because again, this is another event. And what we're gonna do is, we're gonna do something with the event. So handle at task, what we are first gonna do is, we're gonna uh, set the task to, okay, so we're gonna try to, uh, append our new task to the array, okay? So over here, we're adding a new task. We want to append the new task to the array. So basically what we're gonna do is, we're gonna create an object, okay? Do you see these two curly brackets? These two curly brackets means we are creating a JavaScript object. And in this new JavaScript object, we're gonna create a description and the description will be called new task description, okay? And we're gonna add another flag for it that represents whether the task is complete or not. So of course, when you first add the task, it's not complete yet. So we're gonna mark it as false. Okay, so I missed out a comma here. So, okay, this is a JavaScript object from this curly bracket to curly bracket. And we are just specifying the attributes. It has a description, it has a, is complete and we mark it as false. Okay. and. Right now, we're gonna try to uh, just add it. And then you see that, do you see the page refresh? When we try to click add, 
the, the page refreshes. Because what's happening over here is that by default, when you submit a form, the browser will refresh the page. And we actually do not want that the browser to refresh the page because I, like we said, um, React is like a single page application. We don't want it to refresh the page. So we need to do something called event.stop, uh, no, prevent default. Okay, uh, because React actually honors like the default web browser implementation. If we do not want the default web browser implementation, we want to tell it to prevent the default implementation from happening. So we need to say event.prevent default. Okay, so what's going to happen now is if I click on add, okay, then your page will not refresh. But of course, uh, let's just print out what's the, okay, in fact, I'm going to just like set this to new task so that it's clearer. So right now, our new task is an array of one object. Then I'm going to set this to new task. Okay, and then I'm going to print out console.log new task. Okay, I hope that we are not super lost at the moment. Okay, so right now I'm going to add a task that's called like task one. Okay, I add task. It prints out an array of one object. Okay, it has, uh, sorry, I, I want to make it bigger, but I think that's the limit I can go. You know, you'll start to look ugly. So it has a task one and it's complete, it's false. Then suppose if I were to add task two now, I would expect to see like an array of two objects, but I still get an array of one object. Okay, because it's not appending itself to the array yet. We, we actually want to, you see, it's replacing itself with just an array of one object. So what we actually want over here is we want to add the previous contents of the task as well. So we'll use this new operator called a spread operator. It's three dots. The spread operator is three dots followed by what you, what you want to spread. So we already have an array earlier and we want to like spread that array. So it will be task and then a comma. Yeah, I, I was missing an S here. So this task, I'm going to add an S then. Yep, so we, let's try that again. Task one, add. Task two, add. Task three, add. And what you see over here is we have an array of three items. Okay, so let's just try to implement what's happening with this spread operator. This spread operator basically says, okay, you have an array of tasks at the moment. I want you to take it out from the array and add it as individual elements inside this new array over here. So over here, we are creating a new array and we want to take out the existing items from the old task and we are adding the new object over here. Okay, so this is the spread operator. So you, the, the, the question you might ask is, you already have an array. Why can't you just use something like array.push? Why must you like create a brand new array and then uh, manually copy the old items, then add in the new items over here? Why, should, why must you do that? This sounds way too complicated. And the answer is, we want to actually achieve immutability. Okay, immutability is a very important concept in React which uh, really helps it to work very well. So later I'll go through more about immutability. So for those of you who took CS2030, I'm sure you know like, you know, like how this immutability thing works. Okay, so finally our set task function is working and we actually have half an hour left. So we are quite behind time, but I'm, I'm just gonna give you guys two minutes, okay? To read what we've done so far in this sandbox, so you can look at sandbox for just two minutes to read what you've done so far and see like, um, digest the code and let's go.
All right, I'm going to move on. So yeah, I hope that those two minutes were enough for you to digest what's going on again. So next, now that we actually have an array of like tasks, right? We, we actually want to display what's what the, the task that we added at the moment. So, okay. Uh, hang on, not this sandbox. Uh, yeah, so right now we have a task. And this task kind of tell us what task that we have added, but we actually want to display it because right now our tasks are still hard coded. So what we want to do here is we want to replace all this part with actually displaying it from like the task variable. So this is actually pretty simple. I'm just going to show you. So again, you need to write some JavaScript, so curly braces. So task, and because we already have an array of tasks, the, the, this task is an array of like objects. And we want to transform that array of objects into actual DOM elements. So of course we use our trusty friend map. Okay, so inside this map function, it takes in like a transformer or like whatever you call it. So this map, of course, you takes in a, every individual task and then you need to write what it returns. Okay, so of course what it returns, we actually want to return like a browser DOM element. So you can just copy, paste it in here. Okay, and then over here, what you see is a. Uh, okay, right now you don't see anything because I haven't added any tasks yet. So like, let's add hi, and let's add like meow. Then you'll just keep adding stuff. But it's still adding my hard-coded stuff. So I actually want to put my attributes in. So again, change this to JavaScript. Then I want to add task.description. Okay, whether the checkbox is checked or not, I'll just use task.isComplete. Okay, so then you see our hi, our meow, as well as the, the checkboxes over here. Then you see over here, everything is still one one because this number is hard-coded. So how do we get a number over here? Map actually allows you, this is a JavaScript thing or reacting, but map allows you to pass in the index as a second argument. Then you just pass in the index over here. Okay, so right now it's zero, one, two, three, but because this app is not just for, it's not for normal human beings. We need to add one to it. They have one, two, two, three. The two, three is still there because we haven't deleted this. All right. So right now I can add stuff. So like mail, I can add wolf. I can add like rough, rough. Okay. And my to-do list just keeps on growing and keeps on growing. Okay. So that's how I actually display the task over here. And right now, uh, what I'm going to show you next is, uh, let's see, what's next? Okay, so right now what's going to happen is, I'm going to refresh my app and you realize that we have no task here. And no task here, but it's quite weird because we actually, when there's no task in our task list, we don't actually want to show this ugly table header. We actually want to show um, like a message that says, oh, you have no task added. How about you go and add some tasks? So today we're going to introduce like conditional rendering. So what's going to happen is I am going to refactor this. No, I, I'm not going to refactor this yet. I am going to, yep. I am going to just uh, change this table, this table itself. I am not going to show this header if there are no tasks. And I, to do that, I'm just going to wrap it in JavaScript. And how do I know whether there's a task or not? I just need to check the size of this array, this task array. So task.size. If the size is more than zero, then I will render this table. Can you see this? If the task size is more than zero, then I will render this table. Why this double M percent? This double M percent is really just a Boolean of op N operator. So this only happens if this is true. The right-hand side only happens if your table size is more than zero. So right now, nothing is being displayed. But suppose you have to add one item now. Wait, wait why is it not? <laughs> uh, wait, let me see what's happening. Am I missing? Oh yeah, I think I'm missing something. Um,
Oh shit. Uh no, I I referenced the wrong attribute. It's task dot length. So yeah. Uh so right now nothing is being rendered. If I click on add, because my array dot length is more than zero, then I render my table. Okay, so this is like conditional rendering. But actually, what I actually want is to show a message if I don't see anything here. So of course, instead of just this like double ampersand, we can actually do a ternary. Ternary meaning like the question mark thing. So if this is true, then I will show the table. But if this is false, then I will show another element. So I can show a paragraph that says um, no task added and no task added at one above. Okay, so what's going to happen is let me just refresh this app. Okay, what's what this says is that okay, if the task dot length is not more than zero, so false, so it will show no task added at one above. But if I actually add a task, then it will it will render the table itself. Okay. So yeah, that's how we kind of display the added task and as well as uh show a no task message instead of a blank table. But you realize that this whole chunk of code. It's actually very messy right now, okay? You have this, it's even so hard to tell that it's actually a ternary expression. So let's try to abstract this into its own component again. So I'm gonna call this function task list, okay? So what this does is it will just return the table and then over here, I will just task list. Okay, so over here, you realize that um, this guy requires task.map, right? And which is why that it's showing an error. But the thing is, uh, my task actually exists in a state inside my task manager. So how do I find a way to pass the task over to my task list? So what I'm gonna introduce you guys is something called props, okay? So in React, we have this concept of something called props. Basically, we are trying to pass data from the parent to the child component. So in this case, the parent component is task manager, the child component is task list. So you can pass a prop by just uh, passing it as a field, okay? And you can access the props by passing, by accessing the first parameter of like your function, okay? So suppose over here, I, I pass in a prop that's called task. Then for me to read it in my child component, I just need to read my first parameter and access it with prop.task, okay? Which is what I'm gonna demonstrate. Over here, we have, okay, wrong sandbox again. I'm gonna close this. Um, I want to pass my task as a prop. So, I can just task equals to task. So this means I'm passing the task from my parent component in task manager as a prop to the child component task list. And inside task list, I need to receive that prop. So I'll first pass in a parameter here and then my task will be equals to props.task. Okay. Suddenly your code is now compiling again and we have like neater code and you can actually tell that it's kind of like a ternary expression because we pass everything via props into the task list. So let me just test again, add, add, add. All right, okay. So our code still works. Uh, the parameter doesn't have to be named props. You can name it as like, like a hello, then hello, it will still work. Okay, so uh, interesting question. So Bob asked whether the parameter must be named props. So you, what you need to realize is that um, you, even writing React code now, everything is just pure JavaScript. So 
from what we understand about JavaScript, you know, you have a function, you can just pass in like parameters, right? So you can just name your parameter whatever you want and it will still work. But for but following convention, we just name it props, okay? So again, uh, we, are, we have completed this. And let me just expand on what I said about immutability just now. So immutable good mutation is bad. That's what we learned from CS 2030 and stuff because there's like less side effects and stuff. So the rule of thumb is uh, try not to directly mutate your variables already. Always try to create a copy of the objects or the values when you want to change a state. So why do we need to do so? Because uh, React uh, works in a way that, you know, it tries to compare like, like we, like we said, React uses a different algorithm. It tries to compare what has changed. So it will be good for React to just be able to compare the new state with the current state. So for it to do that, it needs to like achieve some form of immutability. You cannot like directly modify your old state. So that's why uh, immutability is very important. Okay. So before we move on to like making the task completion toggle work, uh, you can just go and spend some time uh, looking at the sandbox five and just digest to see what's going on here. We are almost done with the to do this functionality. So uh, I'll give you like one and a half minutes for that. And we'll start now. It's 10 seconds. Okay, let's continue. So next up, what we want to do is we actually want to add the, make the task completion toggle work. So right now our app is almost done. Except that, okay, if I were to add stuff, okay, I can't actually click on it to mark it as completed. So what we're actually trying to change here is we're trying to change this is complete flag. So when we tick on it, we want to make it become true or become false. We want to toggle it. Okay. So how do we do that? We just simply add, um, we just simply add this. Okay. So right now the check is task is complete. Again, we add another event handler over here. This event handler will be, we will call it uh, on change. So, on change basically just runs when, whenever like there's a change, right? So when, yeah, so, so like when there's a change, we want to handle toggle, no, handle task toggle. Okay, let's just call it handle task toggle or something like that. Then on the top, we can actually like write what we actually want to do with it. Okay, so function handle task toggle. Okay, so, yeah, so what happens here is when we actually click on something, what we want to do is we want to, yeah, in fact, let's pass in. Yeah, for us to know which task to toggle, we need to pass in the task that we, that we are working on at the moment. So I will just make the function call and just pass it in the task as well. Okay, so when you tick the box, you call this handle task toggle and pass in the task over here. 
So over here, I take in the task to toggle, task to toggle. And what's going to happen is I'm going to just uh, change the flag from is complete from false, from true to from false to true or true to false, right? So this is going to sound quite complicated again. So new task again. So this is my new array. And because you want to achieve immutability, we want to copy over everything else that's not our current task. So for us to copy over everything else that's not our current task, we want to copy every element except our current task that we are mutating. So we also want to take in the task to toggle index. Okay, so when we want to take in task to toggle index, we also need to pass it in over here. Pass in the task, pass in the index. So what we actually want to do here is we want to take the items that are not part of the task that we are toggling. So uh, task dot slice from zero to task to toggle index. Then as well as from task to toggle index onwards. Okay, so this is basically everything except our task. Then for, for the current task that we want, we want to create a new object for it. So description will be the same as task to toggle dot description. And then whether it's complete or not, it will be the opposite of task to toggle dot is complete. Okay, how do we interpret this? Okay, once again, we are using the spread operator. We want everything from before the current task and we want everything from after the current task, but at the location where the current task is, we create a new object and set the is complete flag to be a toggle. This is quite difficult to understand. It'll be, it's, it's fine if you don't really understand this, but this achieves immutability. And then the next thing is, we just need to set task to new task. All right. And let's see what happens. I add high, I add high to. And if I tick here, handle task toggle is not defined. Why is handle task toggle not? Oh, okay. I put the function in, in the wrong place. Um, yeah, so this handle task to toggle should be inside the should be inside the task list component. Okay, then you end up facing another problem over here. You see the set task has a squiggly red line over it because set task is defined in the task manager here, but right now our task list is a child component. So in task list itself, it doesn't see set task over here. So how do we solve this? Again, we just part set task as a prop. We are passing a function as a prop, the set task function as a prop into task list. Okay, so you can just set task equals to prop dot set task. Okay, so let's just try it out again. Refresh, and I add high, I add high two, I add high three. I can tick, I can tick, I can tick, but of course there's a bug here. Yeah, there's a bug here because I didn't write this properly. Uh, yeah, so you can see that it's like, it's like not slicing the array properly, it's like, inserting there's a oh, there's an off by one error somewhere because like every time i tick i'm creating a brand new object somehow at the wrong place so if i'm not wrong you need to add a plus one over here yeah plus one then it should work so high high one high two and let's tick tick And this is working now. Okay, why plus one over here? Because uh, this guy actually takes the item that is at this element 
But since uh, our, we want our task to toggle index to be this item, the next we want, actually want to slice it from the next item after the task to toggle, task to toggle in, index instead. Okay, then I'm going to show you something else. So you can see that if you have a lot of props to pass, right, this can get pretty old. You need to like, every new prop you pass, you need to like prop start something, prop start something. There's actually a shorthand for this. Okay, so cons, task, and set task equals to props. Okay, these two lines and this line is exactly the same. Like, okay, they are not exactly the same, but they behave the same way. This, this is called object destructuring. It tells JavaScript that, okay, we have an object that's called props, and we want to take out these two attributes from that object called task and set task, and they'll be named as such, okay? And yep, our app still works. A lot to digest, so I'll give one minute. Okay, the, the workshop will overrun, so we'll overrun by a while more. But I'll give you guys one minute to digest the code with Sandbox 7. Okay, Sandbox 7 is a completed result. You guys can have a minute to look at it. Okay, we will continue on. So next, we are gonna try to make this overview work. So you realize the overview here, it, it, we want to display how many tasks that are not complete yet, right? We want to display how many tasks that are not complete. And you realize that actually in the code, it might be, there might be some challenges when you want to do this. Okay, you want to show the number of undone tasks in the overview. So, What's, what's happening here is that our task is currently stored in task manager, but overview box, okay? Overview box, which is a component that lives inside header, which is a component of app, wants to know how many tasks are not complete as well. So the tasks are stored in task manager, but overview box wants to know uh, how many tasks are left undone. And the, the restriction we have here is that the children cannot pass the props to the parents. Okay, that's how React works. Task manager cannot say, hey, app, I can give you some tasks. The children cannot pass the props to parents. So how do we get this task information from here all the way down to overview box? And the answer is we need to do something called lifting of state. Okay, so although it makes a lot of logical sense for you to store the state in like task manager, because overview box needs access to the state, we have to like move it up, okay? We have to move the state from task manager to app, and then we need to pass the task to task manager. We need to pass the task to header as well as to overview box, all the way down the chain to whoever needs it, okay? So if the, so this is known as lifting state up and uh, state should be passed from parent to child as props. So we are gonna try that out right now on the sandbox. So over here, 
we have overview box, right? Overview box right now. Um, yep, right now it just hard codes that, oh, I have five tasks that are not done yet. But I want to actually read how many tasks that are undone from like my task list. So like I said, we need to lift the state up. So this guy, uh, I'm just, okay. I'm gonna set the default for this box to like a blank string again. So I'm this guy, the task has to be removed from task manager, and we need to lift it up to the app itself. So in app itself, we will put a state here. Okay, squiggly lines again because we need to import use state from React. Okay, but because right now the tasks are over here. We, we want to just pass it down to the task manager as well. So task equals to task and set task equals to set task. Okay, but in task manager itself, we also need to, task is not defined, oh yeah. We need to take the prop as well. We need to receive the prop. So props. All right, so right now we have successfully lifted the state from task manager to app and we pass it into task manager. So we just do a quick check whether our, our functionality still works. Uh, whoops. Add. Right, so it still works, but uh, there's a warning that I didn't see earlier. So each child in a list should have a unique key prop. So I forgot to cover this just now, but whenever you do a dot map, in React, okay? The next item that you map it to, it should have a key attribute that you pass in something that uniquely identifies this item, okay? So uh, usually we just pass like something that uniquely identifies the item. Um, you can pass like task.description. You can pass in task.description if it uniquely identifies the item. But of course you can see our code is kind of weird now because we can actually have like say like the description doesn't uniquely identify. You can have two to do's with the same description. So for now, just it's not the best practice, but we'll just pass it as index first. Okay, then we just refresh it. And you see we don't have a browser warning anymore. So why is it passing this key important? Because um, like we said, React needs to figure out what has changed so that it knows what to re-render. Re okay, so so React actually does it for like this type of like dot map type of situations. It does it via this key attribute. And this key attribute, we need to pass in the attribute that uniquely identi identifies the new element or whether the element has changed or not. So whatever we pass inside here should uniquely identify it. And for now, we'll settle with passing it as index as well. Okay. So next, um, yeah, since we lifted the app state to, um, task over here, and we, we, we want our header to actually um, have the task. So we will, of course, need to pass in tasks. Okay, then in to do header itself, okay, in header, we will actually take in the props. And same thing, we take in tasks. And is this enough? This is not enough yet because overview box needs it and overview box is a child component. So we need to pass it down again. And same thing. Okay, in overview box, I'll receive this prop. And right now, this is all the way down. Okay, we have achieved this. We lifted the state here and we pass here and pass here again. Okay, so now let, let's finally make this thing work. You have five tasks that are not done. And what I'm gonna do is, instead of hard coding this number over here, we'll turn it into JavaScript and then tasks. How do we get how many items are left undone, right? So we need to filter it, filter the task by
whether the task is complete or not. Task is, com is complete. Okay, we take the array of tasks, we filter it by whether the task is complete, and we actually want the tasks that are not complete. Then once we get the array of tasks that are not complete, we want to get the length of it. Okay, so right now this kind of works. I'm gonna show it to you. So task one, task two, and task three. So I have three states that are not done. Okay, then right now I take this, I have two tasks, sorry, I, yeah, tasks. I have two tasks that are not done. I take this, I have one task that are not done. Okay, do you realize how magical this all seems? It's because we kind of like, you know, establish like the data bindings correctly. So we only just need to like um, ensure that the JavaScript is being written correctly. And it's because everything is like functional, there's like no side effects. Uh, even though I just take it over here like that, like this will sort of just like, the, the change will just be propagated over to over here. Okay, what are the next problems? The next problem is that your grammar is not right. You have one task that are not done. Okay, then you realize that, okay, I need to conditionally render the S or not, right? Yes, exactly, the components are reactive. You want to conditionally render the S, but does it mean you have to copy this whole thing again and just paste it over here? Then you, you, sound very, you look very weird, right? So actually what we can do here is we can just put this at the top and we just have a variable for it. Const uh, task length. Okay, const task length equals to task.filter. We filter for the incomplete task and we get a length. And then over here, we render task length instead. Okay, so uh, right now we want to conditionally render the S. So you just task length, whether it's equals to one. If it's equals to one, then you don't show the S, but if it's not, then you show the S. Okay, uh, just so that we be correct, it's more than, you know, actually it's equals to one. If it's equal to one, you don't show the S. If it's not equal to one, then you show the S. Okay, we have zero tasks. Yeah, you have zero tasks that are not done. Then, there's still another problem. You have one task that are not done. The R also needs to be conditionally rendered. So, okay, so let's try again. Uh, I'm gonna refresh this. Zero tasks that are not done. Then you have one task that is not done. You have two tasks that are not done, okay? So yeah, right now it's uh, 3 p.m. We are definitely overrunning. So I expect to spend around like 15 to 20 more minutes. If you need to run, uh, no worries. Uh, this session is recorded, but if not, I'll just continue. Okay, so next, what's gonna happen next? Um, yeah, we cover lifting state up. We are gonna actually make the cat fact thing work, okay? So what we're gonna do is cat fact dot. There's this uh, API that will just like give you a like, cat fact over here. So every time I refresh it, every time I refresh it, it will give you a, like a new cat fact. Okay, and that's what we're gonna use. And you see what this API returns you. It returns you like this JavaScript object. Okay, we call this a JSON string, JavaScript object notation. JSON, JSON string. But in essence, you can see it as it's a JavaScript object. Okay, so we're gonna make an API call to this guy. And how we're gonna do that is cat fact box, cat fact, cat fact box. We are gonna introduce something called a site. We're gonna introduce the, the use effect hook. Okay, 
So there's this hook that's called use effect. Okay, what use effect allows us to do is it allows us to perform side effects in function components. Okay, so this is super vague because like when you first read about effects, you're just like, what does effect even mean? So basically, we, are, we just want to do something when something is changed. Okay, so of course what you want is you want to import the use effect hook. Then this is how you actually use it. So uh, use effect then of course is in a is in a lambda again because you want to delay the evaluation. Then this is actually what's going to happen inside the effect. The blue one is what happens inside the effect. And when does this effect run? This if, when this effect runs depends on what you put into this dependency array. We call this a dependency array. These are the variables, the state that React watches out for. So if any of the state over here changes, this effect will run. Okay, so this snippet of code over here, what you see here is, is essentially is telling React, okay, whenever my tasks change, I want you to print it out. Okay, it observes the dependencies array and then runs the effect if there are any changes to any dependencies. Okay, so this that's the use effect hook. And um, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna just use the use effect hook now and we're gonna write an effect. And first I'm gonna have, have a state. So I'm gonna have a cat fact. Then I'm gonna have set cat fact equals to use state. And what's the default cat fact that it should show? The default cat fact it should show is loading cat fact. Okay, so over here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna enter a blank dependency array. What a blank dependency array does is, um, it's not watching for anything, but this effect will run after everything is loaded. After everything is loaded, this effect will run. So when my website is loaded, I want it to actually fetch the cat fact. So we do this with a function that exists in all the web browser that's called fetch, okay? In fetch, we'll just pass in our API endpoint. Okay, API is an application programming interface and we pass in this URL of where we can get that data from. So fetch, then what happens after we receive a response? Then we need to uh, response, we need to pass it to response.json. Then we need to data. We want to map it to data dot data dot fact. Okay, data dot fact. The data is inside a key that's called fact. Okay, I'm gonna I'm going slightly fast now, so pardon the speed, but yeah, data dot fact. Then so data dot fact is how you extract out the response on the API. But we actually want to set the cat fact. All right. So let's see what's happened. Uh, I think the API call is being made, but we are still seeing some cat fact because we need to change this to cat fact. Okay, so we see some cat survive for blah, blah, blah. We refresh this. Another cat fact, we refresh this. Another cat fact. Okay, so what you need to realize here is this fetch thing is not related to React at all. This is just JavaScript. This is a web browser JavaScript function. And over here, this is asynchronous. This fetch function returns a JavaScript promise. It's asynchronous. And you can think about it as, uh, for those of you who did CS930, this is essentially like completable future. Okay. So it returns a promise, which is like a completable future. It takes the response, takes the JavaScript object out of the response. And then the JavaScript object, it extracts out the cat fact. Okay, so, so that's how we make an API call. And that's how we combine use effect and use state to make an API call and retrieve the cat fact. Uh, then of course, uh, we need to account for a case with, uh, Okay, so what's the syntax dot then, right? So this means that, okay, um, 
this fetch function returns a promise. So we, we don't know when the API call is actually going to be completed because uh, it really depends. Sometimes maybe your internet is super slow, then we need to like wait for it to be done. But when the API call actually comes back, what do we want to do with it? We will pass the response. Then when we pass the response already, then we take out the cat fact from it. Yeah, yeah you can interpret it as uh, the dot is uh, slightly confusing, but it's actually just uh, like that. So the promise dot then, then dot then. Okay, then we also need to account for a case for what happens when there's a, there's a error, okay? So suppose like the API is down. Maybe this website, too many people spam it, then it goes down. Or maybe your URL is wrong. Then you want to show an error. So you can actually add like a catch, okay? So this catch over here, it catches an error. Then if it catches an error, you want to set cat fact to something so that the user will not have like a bad experience. They will know that, oh, something bad has happened. Then we will show them that uh, unable to fetch cat fact. Okay. Uh, you can't see this actually happening because there's no error, but suppose I add a TTT, then you say unable to fetch cat fact because this URL endpoint doesn't really work, right? So if you, if you wanted to display the error as well, we can make use, we can just display the error in, in this string as well, okay? You can do like plus error. I think this, I think this will work. Yep, syntax error, unexpected end of JSON input. Okay, we are just really just appending the error over here. But you can see this type of like, this way of writing a string is kind of weird. It's kind of like unwieldy. So I'm gonna, show you something called a JavaScript template string, okay? So instead of using this um, double quotes, we can use something called this uh, tilde, okay? This tilde over here. No, not, not this, is it a tilde? No, this is a, this is a back tick. Yes, this is back tick. Yeah, back tick is, is right below the, it's right below your escape key. So this is a back tick. And then it works like a normal string, okay? It works like a normal string here but you can directly put the variable that you want to print inside here. But you need, so you do the two square brackets add a dollar sign here. Okay, you see the color change here, so blah, blah. You are just, this is a template literal. It's a JavaScript template literal. It literally tells them that, okay, this is my string and I want to plug in these variables inside it. Okay, then Somehow it's not really working. Let me just refresh this. Yep. So the error is here. Then you see the blah, blah at the end. So this is a JavaScript template literal. Okay. So when you write web apps, make sure you think about a uh, handle for error cases as well. Okay. There are a few things that you need to handle when you make a uh, interactive web app, which is the loading. What happens when your contents are still loading? You want the user to know that it's still loading the loading state. Then when it's actually loaded, you display the actual thing that you want to display. Then you also need to handle for the error state. What happens if your code doesn't work and uh, shit hits the fan or whatever, then you need to handle for the error state. Okay? So that's how you make an API call. Um, yeah, I'm not going to give you time to digest this because we're running quite late. So uh, you can review this on your own time. Uh, don't worry. You can also view the fetch MDN the fetch API on, fetch, on MDN, then there's like a guide on how to use fetch. That's how thing, okay? MDN is your best friend as a web developer. Okay, so we are done with the cat fact stuff. Um, yeah, so what's left is really just deployment and data persistence. So of course you guys will have realized, right? Every time I refresh this app, my task is gone. Okay, right now I can add, I can add. And right now my app works. But the moment I visit this website again, everything is gone. Okay, that's because all our tasks right now is actually set just in like a, it's like the running memory of like the app, right? It's, it's stored in like your state but we actually want to persist it and make sure it's safe somewhere, 
All right. So I'm going to introduce you to a browser API that's called local storage. Okay. Local storage, it exists on every single website that you use on a browser. And yeah, if you go to like your browser developer tools, okay, how to open your browser de developer tools, right click, click on inspect on anything. Then if you click on application, you will see local storage here. Okay, you see that this MDN website is actually storing something in our local storage. It's storing this uh, banner plus blah, 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 something that I don't know what they are using it for. They are just storing it here. Okay, so we're gonna use this local storage to store our tasks and store our name so that um, we, we don't actually lose our information. All right, so this is gonna be quite fast, but I'm gonna show you how to do this. Okay. First thing we want to do, the simple one, we want to make it such that when we change our name, okay, we save it and it, when we refresh, it's still what we save it as. All right, so over here, we have a name, we have a use state John Doe. Okay, what's going to happen is um, whenever I set name, I'm actually going to save it to my local storage. Window.local storage, that's how you access the local storage. Then I'm going to set the item. So inside local storage, it allows you to set the key that you want to store and the value. It's a key value store. So it lets you name the key. It lets you uh, specify what's the value you want to store. Okay. So I'm going to name this name. And what's the value I'm going to store here? Okay. I'm going to store the new name that I set. So whenever I set a new name, okay, uh, you're going to see that in your web browser. Okay. Um, I'm going to refresh this. Okay, I'm going to open up my local storage whenever I set a name. So suppose I set Chris. You will see inside the local storage, it shows up here as Chris. Okay, that's a key, that's a value. So what we are going to do here is, the, okay, the saving is done. Right now we're going to load Ensure that we load from local storage as well. So over here, instead of displaying like the default name, we are going to say loading name. Okay. So how do we actually like load this name? We require a site effect. So same as earlier, we need a use effect. Okay. Use effect. And we want this to run when we first load it, okay? So when the page is first loaded, we, we want to window.localstorage.getItem. And what's the name of our item? The name of our item is called name, okay? Then we need to assign it somewhere. So const save name, okay? That's how we load an item from local storage. And then you need to be very careful about one thing. What if, the user has never saved a name before. This save name could be now. Okay, this save name could be now. So we actually want to set name to save name. But we also want to account for the case where save name could be now. Save name now means that the user has never saved a name before. So if save name is now, we want to set a default name. Okay, uh, actually, let me just say it to default name. Default name. Okay, so there's this new operator that I'm introducing here. This question mark, question mark. This is called the nullish coalescing operator. What this means is if this value is not now, I will use this value. But if this value is now, then I will use the one on the right. Okay. This is called a nullish coalescing operator, and that's how it works. So let's just, uh, I'm going to refresh here. And yeah, you see it loaded my name. It loaded my name, and then it set my name. Okay. So I can click on it. I can say my name is uh, Daryl. So suppose my name is Daryl. Okay. Daryl, then you see in local story, it changed to Daryl. 
And now I do a hard refresh of my app. My name is still Daryl because it's saved in my local storage. What happens if I do not have this key? So suppose like someone visit your to-do list for the first time. I delete this key. Okay, we refresh. This key doesn't exist. So because of the knowledge coalescing operator, this ends up being now because they try to fetch it from local storage, they cannot get it. This guy is now, will end up with default name. Okay, then I can finally set my name. Right now, the key doesn't exist. The moment I click OK, the name is here. Okay, so that's how you use this to um, write an overview box, okay? Like write an overview box. Um, okay, what's the, I'm introducing you guys a lot of stuff here. You don't have to use this knowledge coalescing operator. Uh, in fact, you could even use the all operator. This will work too. Okay, but I'm just trying to introduce you guys to as many modern JavaScript features as possible. And so that when you read other people's code, you can also like um, be able to understand other people's code. So this is the knowledge coalescing operator. Yep. Okay. So next, our name is safe. We want our task to be safe as well. Right? So go to where our task is safe. Our task is safe inside this state over here. Okay. So again, whenever we set a task, we want to actually save it to local storage. So there are many ways we could write this, but I'm gonna do a very hacky way right now. Okay, I'm gonna write a function called set task. Then I'm gonna I'm gonna rename this to set task state. Okay, so new task. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set task state. To a new task. Okay, so this is this gives you the same functionality as before. It's just that I'm passing in this intermediate function that I created. So right now our app, the functionality is still the same. But right now on top of this, I actually want to do a window.localstorage.save item. Uh, no. Set item. All right. So I'm gonna give you a name of task. So what am I gonna save here? When, so basically this function set task is run whenever, whenever we want to like mutate our task, right? So by just like swapping it out like that, we ensure that whenever we mutate the task, you'll be saved to local storage as well. So over here, we want to save it to local storage, but local storage only saves a string, but we want to save it our object, okay? So we, we, want, we wanted to do something like that, but local storage only takes in a string. If you run this, uh, I think it probably will crash. Uh, okay, I don't know where the error is. Uh, yeah, but never mind. Um, so it will, it will crash because right. Um, to pass to to use that item, you need to pass in a string. But because it, right now we have a JavaScript object, we actually need to json.stringify it. So what this does, it, it turns our object into a string. Okay, gonna refresh it. And then whenever we save a task, okay, it will turn it into a string and then it will save it into our local storage. Okay, same thing. So now when we load our task, we also need to use a use effect. And we also want this to run when our app starts to load. Okay, so set task state. Okay, we want to set our task state to uh, from window.localstorage.get. Then we get our task. So save task. Okay, so we get our task from local storage. But because local storage only saves a string, we actually need to convert it back to an object again. So you need to use something called json.pass. Okay, this basically like passes that JSON string and turns it into a JavaScript object. Okay, then we set, set our task state to our save task. 
but there's a chance it might be now as well. So if it's now, we set this to an empty array. Okay, so right now, our web app is actually complete. Okay, you see I refresh my web app, this guy is still here. And I suppose I add, add stuff here, I add like, uh, and the uh, workshop. Okay, then I have two items here. Refresh here. Then I have end the workshop as well. Okay, so how this looks like in your local storage is you look like task, and then it's a JSON string of the objects. All right. So we are actually done with the data persistence part. We are on to the very, very last part, which is deployment. Okay. Um, yeah, so before I move on to that, let me just talk about local storage. Uh, local storage is not a React thing. It's a web browser API thing that you use JavaScript to use. So um, even though you are writing a React web app, it's, it's also very useful for you to be familiar with uh, how to use like native browser APIs and stuff and combine that with React. And that's how you actually like uh, make like apps that work pretty well and all. And how, that's how you become a good software engineer. You must ensure that you know your web browser well as well. Yeah. Okay, next, moving on to deployment. So I'm going to show you this thing called Vercel. Okay, uh, let me, Vercel.app. Uh, this is the very last part already. It's okay if you miss out on this. You are already good enough to venture out and make a React app on your own. But for Vercel, basically what this website does is it's free and it helps you to deploy your React web app. Okay, so what, what, what's happening here is, um, yep, uh, I actually exported this thing to my GitHub account. So github.com slash ChrisGZF. So I created the React workshop to do this on GitHub already. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna integrate this with Vercel right now. Okay, I'm gonna new project. So I can import a Git repository. So I'm gonna import this React workshop to-do list that we really just created together. Okay. So React workshop to-do list. Okay, I'm gonna import this. And I'm gonna just import it to my personal account. And they can detect that it's a create React app, kind of React app and you can just click deploy. Okay, so what ha what's happening is Vercel is just cloning my GitHub repository and it's deploying it right now. And while it's building, I'm gonna just clone the repository to my, to my own computer as well. So uh, for those of you who know how to use Git, uh, yep, this is basically how you do it. So I'm gonna clone this GitHub repository, git clone. So this code is essentially in my machine right now. Then I'm gonna open it with uh, Visual Studio Code, right? Visual Studio Code, what most of us are familiar with. So Chris, uh, oh yeah, React Workshop to do this. All right, sorry for the wait. So yeah, finally I'm opening up this uh, React, this our React app, right? Okay, so before I move on to show you this, actually, let me just uh, show you how you can develop locally. Okay, so um, what I asked you guys to install just now is like yarn and all, right? So you can actually just, to develop locally, you can just like yarn, you can just run yarn, then you'll just install everything here. So you, it's installing React now, it's, it's installing like the React scripts and all. Okay, so yeah, it takes a while to install, but never mind. Um, it's deployed right now, so I can actually just visit it. So you can see my React workshop to-do list is now hosted on like a link on Vercel. Okay, this is a permanent link. It's not like your 
code sandbox link that's like transient and could change anytime. Okay, this is a permanent link that you can use for your project. Okay, so if you guys visit this link right now, you will see exactly what I'm seeing right now as well. Okay. And um, on Vercel, how it looks like is basically it's a React workshop to-do list. It, it shows you that it's linked to your GitHub. It's linked to your GitHub. And what I'm going to do now is I am going to make a change. Okay. Uh, suppose like my teammate was uh, decided to use a very bad title for the to-do list. I want to change it to very cool to-do list. So after I made this code change, we are going to do something called continuous delivery or continuous deployment. So I made this change. I'm going to commit this change to GitHub right now. Okay. So I changed header.js. Uh, you should commit your, your log file, but do not commit node modules. Okay. So git add yarn.log, git add source components header.js. Okay. So um, git status, I added these two new files that I changed and I'm going to commit it to my git repository. Okay. Add um, updated header. Okay. So this is a new commit. So this to like represent like you guys, you know, when you're, you're working on a project, then you, you have incre incremental changes and you want to, you know, push to your GitHub repository. So git push, git push won't work because I haven't pushed once to my origin main yet. Oh, it works. Okay, it works. I take that back. But yeah, so I git push. So in my GitHub repository, instead of the initial commit, you will see that it has the add updated header change right now. Okay, do you see this yellow dot over here? What's happening right now is Vercel actually picked up that there's a new commit and it's redeploying this whole website right now. So right now, um, if I were to refresh the page, you will see very cool to do this. Okay. So this is what we call continuous delivery, continuous, de continuous deployment. Whenever you push a new code change directly on your production website, you will see it live on the spot immediately. So this is very useful for you guys when you know how you need to like uh, do some user testing, send it to your friends for them to try out your app or just to maybe test it out on your own mobile phones or anything. You can just deploy it to Vercel. Vercel is free. You can generate a link like that. And yeah. And Vercel is so good that like it even supports custom domains. All right. So over here, I have this React to-do list Vercel app, right? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just open this project and inside is settings. I can actually choose which domain to deploy it to. Okay, so right now it's, it's only available at this link, but because I've added my own personal domain, I can just define a subdomain. I can say like uh, uh, my to do dot Christopher dot SG. I click on add because I've already added my own domain name to the to my Vercel account. I can just go to my to do dot Christopher dot SG. And the app is here. Okay. So the TLDR is, Vercel is awesome, use it, okay? Vercel also works for private repositories as well. Eh, no, does it? Yeah, it works for private repositories, but it does not work for organization. No, it works for organization re repositories, but you need to pay for a plan. So for you and your Orbiter teammate, just make a private repository or a public one up to you guys and just share it with yourself. Link it to Vercel. Any change you make will be deployed. All right, okay, deployment settled. So just to summarize everything, um, what we've made so far today, really, is our finished to-do list app, okay? Uh, everything kind of just works. There's a cat fact, uh, you, can, you can create, you can update, you can read it, you just can't really delete it yet, okay? Um, deleting the, the items over here is left as an exercise for the intelligent reader, so yeah. Okay, uh, recap. Components are the building blocks of React. 
props refer to data that you pass from a parent to a child. State refers to things that you want to, data you want to maintain within your component. And whenever a prop or state is changed, your component is re-rendered. So if your state needs to be shared across components, you need to lift it up in the common ancestor. Okay, try to make everything immutable, do not modify state directly. And uh, just a recap, uh, this is the ending recap. recap um, your React component should ideally have its own file. And yeah, you, sh you should just try to break things down into small components that makes logical sense for you guys. Okay, and of course you can import or export your React components. There's a very useful uh, extension here that I want to introduce you guys called the React Dev Tools. So do you see this uh, orange thing over here? No, okay, it's not orange, it's gray. Um, <laughs> there's this extension here called the React Dev Tools. Go to your respective web browsers, app store and install it. It's very useful for making a React app. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so whenever you have a React app, after you install this, uh, this uh, React Dev Tools, this tool will be blue, okay? If, it, if you are in, on your development build, it will be orange or something. But what it does is, it helps you to inspect the virtual DOM, okay? Right now, I right-click Inspect Element. Uh, what you see over here is the HTML. This is raw HTML. It's not the, it's not the, it's not the React, DOM yet, but if you click on the components part, okay, this components is added by the React Dev Tools. Uh, you can actually see like this um the React component tree. Okay, right now it's super cryptic UI O J H because this is the production build, but in your development build, in your development build, where's my development build? Yeah, this is the development build. If I were to open up the components, you will see that. The component tree is still in its own like full name. You can even see what's the current state at the moment. You can see what effects there are at the moment. You can see what props are passed. Okay, the props that are passed here is like your task, your number zero, number one. Okay. The and like I said, the development build is like orange color. So yeah, install the React Dev Tools. Very useful. All right, so uh, like I said at the start, there's, this workshop is not sufficient enough to make you good at React, okay? You need to uh, read a lot of, uh, you need to like, you know, suffer a lot more before you get good at React essentially, okay? So over here, there are these, these two materials here, the learn X in one minute, there's a HTML one and there's a JavaScript one, okay? These are for people who are not for, too familiar with HTML and JavaScript, these are very quick, Web references, you can just look at it and you kind of, it's a very concise, succinct documentation of what HTML is about, same for the JavaScript one. Then this one is a React, uh, this is a JavaScript, but the, the parts that you most likely would like to use for React. So please read this. Then uh, of everything here, they are very useful, make sure you read them. Then moving on, these are like the more optional parts. Uh, they're not really optional. I really do recommend that you figure out how to use ESLint and Prettier. Okay, ESLint and Prettier, they help you to write uh, React code that uh, follows conventions uh, and like um, Prettier helps you to format your code. Okay, so I can show you my VS code. If I open up my settings, right? What happens is over here in my settings, there is a editor format on save. Okay, editor format on save. So this is inside your VS code settings, editor format on save. What's, what this does for me is whenever I write React code, so suppose I mess up the order, it looks super ugly right now. I just save it. Prettier will just run and you will just format everything for me. Okay, so use Prettier, use ESLint. Then if you would like to move on to more advanced stuff, Okay, you can use TypeScript. TypeScript is like another programming language that's a superset of, is it a superset? Yeah, it's a superset of, of JavaScript. And it adds like uh, typings, it adds like, you know, uh, if you, you guys are more familiar with type languages, like those languages that let you define whether it's a number, whether it's a string or not, you can use TypeScript. Or even you want to use generics, you can use TypeScript. Okay, 
And if you want to use, learn more like advanced state management, you can use Redux. Okay, Redux is like a more advanced concept. So these are the things that you could use. And with that, I think we've come to the end of this very long workshop. Sorry for being so much over time. I hope that you guys learned something new today. Yep, I'll be here to take questions. Okay, all the resources are inside this doc over here. So when the recording is out, I will also update the link over here. But essentially, uh, all the code sandboxes are here. You can see all the milestones that we've done and what each part is for you guys to learn. Okay, and just click on it and you can just explore it. Yeah, and yeah, I wanted to show how to run like my React code locally. So earlier just now, I, I installed all my dependencies, right? So I run yarn, yarn install all the dependencies. So I can actually just run yarn start. Okay, when I run yarn start in my this directory, then it will run the create React app starting uh, script. So it will start up a development server for me. Okay, right now it says you can now view Orbiter React 12 deployment in the browser. So you open up your browser, you host this local development server and you'll be in localhost port 3000. So, I mean, it, it kind of open it up for me. And even tells you that on your own network, okay, suppose you, you, you are using a mobile phone that's like on the same Wi-Fi network as you or same like internet connection as you, you can just visit this link on like other computers on the network and it will reach this development server as well. Okay, so this is my development build that I'm running locally. Okay, and the local development build is super cool. Okay, essentially it has hot reload as well like in code sandbox. So suppose I wanted to change it to not very cool. Okay, not very cool. Okay, and I make my, once again, I make it very ugly. I save it, prettier formats it. This development server will recognize that there's a change. It will reload it on the spot. Okay, and it will become not very cool to do this. Okay, in fact, let me just very quickly just demonstrate this again. Uh, super not very cool to do this. Okay, I'm going to save it. Save. My browser refreshes automatically. So this hot reload is, is a feature of like a create React app and it's what makes developing React web apps so like delightful as well. So make sure you use it. And yeah, so that's how you run the development server. So so inside package.json, what you see is that there's a, when you run yarn, yarn start, right? So it, it just runs the start, it starts the development server. But when you actually want to output it to like a just plain HTML, CSS, JavaScript, right? You can run yarn build, okay? Yarn build. So yarn build basically runs this script over here. And then you say, okay, create an optimized production build. Okay, so over here, over here, my React web app is now saved in uh, okay, it's now saved in this build folder. So this build folder is no longer a Node.js app. This build folder is plain HTML CSS JS. Okay. This is like a compiled version of your app. And if I were to open it in my web browser right now, okay, let me open with, okay, Firefox is opening, but let me open with Chrome. Okay, this is the, the okay, you, you can't do this anymore. You, you used to be able to do this, but uh, you can't like directly click on the production build anymore because of like security restrictions. So the thing is uh, right now, what you see over here is really the bare bones version of your React app. Okay, it, it, this is the bare bones version of your React app. And in fact, the JavaScript that is output by the production build is completely unreadable to you. Okay, I'm gonna show you. I go to build folder, I go to JS. Okay, the code that we wrote just now for the to-do list, right? It ends up being this. 
is completely unreadable to you because it's compiled. They sort of like just minified everything, make everything super small. And this is like the production output. All right, which also explains why in your production build, in your production build, your React developer tools just tells you like it's UI, J, O, H, B. Okay, and with that, we are done. All right, any questions or anyone? Hi, Chris. Sorry, for Vercel, right? Does it track a particular branch in your G or in your repo or is it just... Oh, you can specify, like... you can specify it. So, um, okay, hey, Vercel. Okay, that's a very good question you just asked there. Um, so over here, okay, I have settings and I can have, okay, hang on, uh, let me just, Okay, so there's a production branch. You can choose which branch you want to deploy to the as a production branch. So sometimes what happens is that, you know, you and your teammates, you guys are developing very quickly, pushing a lot of new changes to like your master branch, your, your main branch. So you don't want the users who visit your site to just constantly see the unstable version, right? So you can you can name it, you can name your production branch something like deploy. Then okay. you can push to a deploy branch, then only when you want to make a new release of your web app, then you push to the deploy, deploy branch. Okay, that's a, that's a very cool thing you can do. And in fact, in fact, you can even do things like um, branch specific deploys. Okay, so what I mean is suppose like, uh, so suppose this, this is my uh, production URL, okay? Cause this is the one that I want people to who actually want to use the app to use. Then I can, I can deploy it to the branch deploy. Okay, uh, right now it says it cannot find. Okay. But it, yeah, but so, so like I will deploy the, the deploy branch to the production one, but over here I can make this like a, it's like a, I can just make it deploy main. So this, this, this guy deploys main, this guy deploys uh, okay, understand. production branch. Then you have like a staging website for yourself. Okay, can thank you. Okay. Yeah. That's the I, I have a question yeah. regarding uh just now you're mentioning like saving information so that when you refresh it's still the same. Mm -hmm. So suppose now like like I I want to in my project say I want to have different accounts for different people. So like Facebook, when you log in, when a user logs into an account, say uh, Christopher, then yeah. the name displays Christopher. But then when I log in into another account, then it will remember, say, another name and display an, another set of tasks. Okay. Uh, how do you do this? Yeah. So basically, essentially, right, like what I showed you just now, persistence with local storage, as the name suggests, is local storage. Like, it only exists over here. Okay. It is only stored on your computer. It's only stored on this browser. In fact, if I if I were to uh, open the exact same link, uh, hang on. If I were to open the exact same link on Firefox, I will see very different thing because it's stored in the browser itself. So what you what you sound like you want to do is you actually want to save this data on the internet, right? So for you to do that, you can I actually suggest something using like Firebase. And Firebase actually like, um, so like you, you need to save your data on the internet. So you cannot use local storage. Then you, you probably, the, Firebase has a lot of products. So there's like Fire, Firebase of authentication. So this helps you to very quickly uh, integrate with React and build like a user login, Firebase authentication. Then suppose you want to store your, your tasks or everything on like an online database. You can use Firebase Firestore. So Firebase Firestore is a, is a database, it's a NoSQL cloud database that you could, that lives on a Google server that you that is free and you can just use it as well. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so is Firebase actually a backend or is it a database? That's a difficult to answer question. Uh, I won't cons, okay. Mm. Okay, okay, now my button. You can see that it's a, 
No, it's an external service that your app, your front end app can interact with to store data. You could sort of look at it as a back end as well. Because the thing is when you when you when you talk about uh back end, it's a very broad term, right? It's like that we there's no like specific definition of what a back end means. So you could consider this as a back end as well. How would you compare, for example, like Firebase to like Express JS, like in terms of the learning curve and like the usability for this purpose? Like say if I had to like Facebook or Instagram okay. have mm -hmm. some users have their own account and log in. Uh, they are not mutually exclusive. So you could have an Express JS backend and use Firebase at the same time as well. And or you could just rely on either. You could just use Firebase or you could just use ExpressJS as well. Uh, so I guess uh, it's, it's hard for me to answer that question because uh, it really depends on like, you need to find out more about which of these technologies suit your project more and what you want to learn out of this whole project. So for example, if you really want to implement no, um, like the entire authentication flow on your own, then you can use like a Express with a Passport.js, okay? Express with uh, passport.js for like authentication. Then this one basically you are, you are writing your own backend on your own, like your own authentication, everything on your own using like, although it's using some third party libraries, you are still doing a, li a little bit more manual work. But if you want to do the same thing, but like have Google abstract everything for you, then you could use like Firebase uh, authentication. So it really depends on what you want to learn, what you what your project requires. Will you be covering like during the next tutorial how to integrate like front end into back end because for now like how to store data in back end and some stuff just like some simple back end. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in the part two, I'll be covering how to add the party libraries and uh, basically I'll be talking about how to use Firebase authentication and Firebase data store, uh, Firebase Fire Store. Um, okay, these are a bit a bit of a stretch as well. Like this, there's a lot to cover in part two as well. So I can't, I, I can't be 100% sure I'll be covering this, but this is what I will cover. La. But I won't cover how to make your own um, back end. But what I can recommend you guys to use is like uh, resources that you can rely on. So of course you can use express.js. That's like, that's like the most commonly used uh, JavaScript back end framework type of thing. Okay, so express.js, go to their website, click on getting started and just follow that tutorial. Okay, and but what you can also use is uh, you can use like uh, CS50X web programming. So this is like one of the MOOCs that teaches you essentially everything I'm teaching you plus a lot more. Okay, it's an MOOC that teaches you uh, how to create a front end with HTML, CSS and JavaScript. I, I'm not sure if, if, if they do react. I haven't done this before. I've never done this before to be very clear. I think they use the Django for this. Yeah, and then they use like Django, they use Python as a back end. Uh, you could do this as well, but this doesn't use React. From looking at the code now, it doesn't use React. La. So yeah, it's really just find your own resources. There's a free code cam as well. Uh, refer to the Orbiter Mega resource list that your advisor should share with you. There's a lot of resources there that you guys can just look up on what you want to learn and just like refer to it. La. Okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, any last questions? Uh, you want to deploy a Flask app? If you want to use Flask app, look for Heroku. Heroku does it for free. Uh, okay, Heroku does a lot of things for free. La, okay, basically, Heroku is very widely used. Uh, you can just Heroku Flask. Just Google for this. Then I'm pretty sure there's a shit ton of like tutorials about this. Okay, uh, I recommend using Heroku, but uh, Heroku can be slow at times because the free plan means that your server is inside, is in the US. So the US means that whenever you like try to make an API call and everything, you take like 300 milliseconds or something. So there's uh, also a lot of resources on the GitHub student developer pack. Okay, GitHub student developer pack. Look for this. Essentially, you are given free cloud hosting credits. You can host on like digital ocean. You can host uh, you can host on DigitalOcean, you can host on like uh, Azure. Azure gives you a free uh, B1S instance if you're a student, that type of thing. So these are the type of like 
platforms you can use to host your back end. But for front end, really for simplicity, I just recommend you use Vercel. Vercel is great. Vercel is fast. Vercel has a content delivery network. So yeah. Do we need to do more manual work if we use ExpressJS as compared to other backends such as Firebase? Since ExpressJS is minimalist, uh, I would think so, but then again, there's no good way for me to quantify how much manual work you need to do. So yeah, your knowledge may vary. So uh, I guess for you to get started, it's really just you need to find like a quality tutorial and just look at those medium articles. Maybe uh, some of the medium tutorials are really not so good. Some are really quite good. And then uh, look around for like free code cam, look for the, okay, the medium article, just look at the number of claps and like really just read and see like the quality of writing. Is it like understandable at all? Then there are some log rocket articles that are quite good as well. Uh, just read them and slowly decide on what you want to use. Uh. You have to do your own research. I can't tell you that Firebase is better. I can't tell you that Fire Express is better. Yeah. So one question, is Vassal and Heroku the same thing or different? Um, no. Okay, so I, I, I recommended Heroku because uh, so, because like Sam was asking, uh, he, he said he wanted to deploy like a Flask app. But uh, from what I understand, Vercel is, is mostly for front-end web applications. So I'm not sure Vercel can deploy a Flask app. So, but I know like Heroku can. So yeah, so I would say Vercel for the front-end, Heroku for the back-end, or you could do your own self-hosting of like, your own backend using one of the free cloud credits that we have as like student developers. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wait, sorry, one last question. So if you host an uh, application on Heroku, you still need another like platform like Vercel to host a front end or you don't need anymore? Or you can just build, build your React project and then you just host it together with your Heroku app. Hmm, interesting question. So it's hard for me to answer that as well because there are many ways you could do things, okay? So you could have a separate, um, you can have a separate solution to just host your back end, a separate solution to host your front end. Then they still can communicate with each other via API calls. Okay, yes. I, you yep. could also have just everything be hosted on like, one server. So the one server is both your front end and back end, and which is usually what a lot of like the beginner Ruby on Rails project does. So the Ruby on Rails project, it sort of acts like, like a back end and it also like serves your front end React code as well. So mm. yeah, there are many ways to go about doing things. It's really up to you guys. I, at this level, okay. I don't think we are too concerned about how you do it as long as your app kind of works. Just piece together something working. I think we are, we are okay with it. Okay, thank you, Chris. Okay, I guess if there are no other questions, last 10 seconds. All right, if not, I'll just uh, end this meeting right now. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, yep, stay safe and have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. <laughs>